right here. You have to make sure that you sound good, okay? That's the microphone, so people are gonna hear you. There'll be no sin there in that place for all of men is saved by grace and no earthquake. to you. Y'all ready to sing? How about page number 44, please? Page number 44, for a long time I travel down the long, lonely road. Thank God I am free. Oh, yes. How about that first verse? Page number 44. Sing it out. For a long time I travel down the long, lonely road. My heart was so Then I heard about Jesus. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad that I found him. He would bring me out. Well, sing about it now. Sing about it. Thank God I am free. Free. been born again. Oh, hallelujah. I'm saved. Saved. Ah. Praise God. I'm so glad that I found out he would bring me out. Like a bird out of prison. Like a bird out of prison. That's it. every night. There will be a happy meeting in heaven.
oh, tasting, tasting. Can you hear me? How about, <laughs> no, <laughs> the blood will never lose its bar. How about that chorus? It reaches to the highest mountain. Sing that chorus. All right, let's start us off on the chorus. Sing it from your heart now. It reaches and it reaches to the highest mountain. Oh. song church song that is yes brother Barnett I've got so much to praise him for get us a key all right right there you all know the song I've got so much to praise him for or thank him for let's sing that chorus if you know the song I think it's in there somewhere you go find the words if you don't know the words I've got so much, sing it out on the chorus, and I've got so much to thank you for, to praise him for you see, he has been so good, of what? Oh, look at 
this part right here. And every day my way gets brighter the longer I Keep it real right here. Yes. Sing it from your heart now. testify on that. How many would say the Lord is good? Tell it. The Lord is good. All the time. Oh yeah. Let's sing it together. The Lord is good. And tell it wherever you go. The Lord some specials waiting for us in the auditorium so let's work our way in there thank you for call singing thank you for be being a part of our sing inspiration all right let's put all the songbooks right here on that table right there that'd be great thank you so much time. 
when my storm was raging high. I'll never understand just why you love me and why I am so blessed. When my words have failed me, Lord, I find thank you says it best. I'll never understand just why you love me and why I am so blessed. When my words have failed me, Lord, I find thank you says it best.
paid the titles made to me
A very good evening to you. 400, 378, 378, please. Oh, I want to hear you sing tonight. Give it all you've got, 378. One piece like a river, attended my way when peace.
it's well if you're going to heaven, amen. It's well if you have eternal life. You get to see the streets of gold and the, the gates of pearl and get to see Jesus one of these days. It's well, I guess, if you're not going to die and go to hell. It's well if you have purpose in your life. Man, it's well with my soul. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. It doesn't matter what circumstances we're going through. It doesn't matter the, the experiences we're going through. But it is well because we have all the promises of God. And the promises of God are true and everlasting. Amen. Aren't you glad we're saved? Amen. Aren't you glad for the precious blood of Christ? Aren't you glad for Calvary? Amen. It is well. Brother Putin, what are you going through? It doesn't matter because it's well. Amen. But, but don't you care about the hardships and the heartaches? It doesn't matter because it is well. And with Jesus, it is well. Amen. We welcome you to the last night of Pastor's Conference. Pastor's Conference has a special place in my heart. It was... Um, that uh, first pastor's conference where Dr. Curtis Hudson preached. I don't remember the sermon, but I do remember the invitation time. I do remember the conviction. Nobody had to convince me I was a sinner. I knew it. I knew I was supposed to die and go to hell. But I'm so glad that I also found out that Jesus took my place. And that day, I received eternal life. It is well, amen. <laughs> it is well. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do love you. And God, we don't deserve anything. God, you're so gracious to us. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for your precious blood. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for your love for us. I pray, dear God, that you'd help us to honor you in this meeting tonight. May we be drawn closer to you. You're a wonderful God a wonderful Savior. We don't deserve any of your mercies, and yet they're new and fresh every morning. We love you, Lord. Thank you for our guest, and thank you for the time we've met with you this week. It's been great, and I pray, dear God, that you'd meet with us again one more time. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Beside me, for I'm sheltered in the arms of God. So let the storms rage, the dark clouds rise. They won't worry me, for I'm sheltered.
Thing, looking for a city, and maybe we'll pull it out tonight. Can you see that? Are you in singing voice? Yes, sir. And if you have a hard time, give us a nod, and I'll get Brother Flood up there, and he can sing with you. And uh, that would be great. Looking for a city. Can you sing that choir? Come on. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Here among the shadows in a lonely land Were a band of pilgrims on the move Burdened down with sorrow shunned on every hand Looking for a city built above Blessed Savior's love Though we may be strangers In this world of care But we're looking for a city built above
Yes, thank you, choir, instrumentalist, orchestra, and Vestal. Ah, uh, good. Got enough strength to lead us on. Oh, what a savior. Page number? 324, turn your songbooks. Page number 324. Let's stand together, please, as the choir joins us. He's my savior because he gave his life for me. Oh, praise God. Somebody say amen tonight. Sing that chorus. He's my savior. When the 
Just turn in your psalm book there. Let's look at the psalm, page 245. And um, we owe so much in this church to Dr. Curtis Hudson, and I just have a two-minute clip I want you to see, and it's not a big video or anything, but I remember when your dad and you remember so well Brother Hudson, when he got so sick, he'd sing The Winning Side. He'd also sing this song. And I can remember him so very frail as he would sing, uh, he passed away at 60 years of age, um, and there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. 
I wonder, fellas, can we just uh, see a little bit of that right there, if you'll get it ready? And it's a great song. Those children have been so wonderful. Oh, his daughter Sherry said, Ned and Hattie, we don't, I hate to talk about things like this. We need to talk. She said, what do you want in your tombstone? The grave marker, if God calls you home. I said, on the back of it, put the plan of salvation. I'll write it for you. On the front, of my name, I want you to put the last two verses. There's a fountain filled with blood. <laughs> and I'm going to sing them for you if I can. Let me hear the key of flesh. Ever since by faith I saw to your dad and brother Tony. I thank the Lord. I imagine the Lord will pull back the curtain once in a while. Perhaps tonight he'll be watching you preach. And we thank God for his great memory. I was walking to church tonight and thinking about uh, one of the last times he was here, he was so sick. And uh, my wife and I were going to take him to lunch. He said, I just, I just don't think. I better go to lunch. And uh, so we took him back to the hotel. And we got almost all the way home. And I noticed his Bible, he left it in the back seat. And so we turned around, and my wife said, he's going to want that Bible for tonight. And we got back there, and uh, I got to the lobby, and I looked out, and I saw the swimming pool. <laughs> I've told this to Brother Tony, it's okay. I saw the swimming pool, and I saw him sitting in a reclining, one of those chairs, with no shirt on and a swimming suit. And I thought, what in the world is going on here? I said, I know that's not him, but it is him. And I said, I got his Bible. Do I walk up to him and give him his Bible in that swimming suit and no shirt on? What, what, what's going on? And I stood there and stood there, and I got closer and closer, and it wasn't him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh my goodness. I mean, what do you do? Praise God. Stay fully clothed till the finish there. Oh, brother. I'm going to have the church. We're going to make the bloopers. When Brother Tim was here and Ryan, our other our, our son-in-law, they all, the, and Brother Panera, he's always nice to me. But those two guys, Sunday night they'd come after church and they would have fellowship and they all was bloopers dad made today. And they were merciless, just un, just terrible. Tiffany, our daughter, won a, as a high school, she won a, 
a lady to Christ and said, Mom, Dad, they have a lot of kids, and they're, they're in church, Sunday school today. Oh, we got so excited. My wife met the lady, and she said, when are you due? And she wasn't due. <laughs> They walked down the hallway, and I walked out the door. I said, well, God bless you. Tiffany's told about you. How you feeling? When do you do? I told that to Tiffany. She said, well, they'll never be back in church. My first convert, and they never came back to church. So that's not something you want. To, oh, I pull, you know, you've heard me say it. I, I, had, I had Nicodemus in the tree one service. Nicodemus, you come down. And that lady, lady's trio that night sang, Nicodemus was a wee little man. <laughs> if you preachers, I, got, I was preaching one night in the old building. Oh, it had to be 35, 40 years ago. And I got the walls of Jericho and Gideon's story mixed up. Have you ever done that, Brother Callahan? Thank you very much. I had those two stories. And I'll tell you, I, I, and then I, I got on and said, oh, no, this is wrong. And I tried to get back on it. I was so mixed up, finally, I just quit. I mean, it was, it was terrible. You say, was the touch on that night? There was no touch, I'll tell you that right now. But, um, the preachers this week have all hit. I was hoping they'd get a base hit or on base or maybe a double. I didn't think, you know, maybe a home run. But the each one hit a grand slam. And <laughs> Jack, Jack Hiles used to finish this thing out. And we'd pick up at the airport, and he said, How's it gone this week? I said, man, every preacher's been great. He goes, could you tell me one time they all dropped a bomb and I'm here to salvage the meeting? He said, no, the pressure's on you. You better come through tonight. So Brother Hudson, you've been here and uh, everyone's been such a blessing. We have a lady back here, Mrs. Snyder. Are you back there from uh, North Carolina? And she was the sweet little lady that tripped right there and felt, well, as soon as I saw her going down, I said, well, she just broke her ankle. I'm a prophet. <laughs> and uh, I saw it, she had broken her ankle. Same thing my wife did the first injury. And you're here tonight, and uh, way in the back, sitting behind the post. When people sit behind the post, there's always a reason they don't want the preacher to see them. And so when that happens, I just move over here. <laughs> yeah. I was preaching outside Gettysburg years ago, and uh, the church, and I always watch the crowd. I think I can read the crowd most of the time. I never ask them, Who, who's giving you trouble? What, what's going on? I don't want to know that. To me, that's, I don't want to be that way. But I got off on money, and the guy in the very back, where that backslider, Mrs. Snyder, is sitting tonight, <laughs> guy way in the back, boy, he got squirmish when I got on money. I could feel it. And so I think I'll camp here a while. And the more I camped there, the, the, the more uncomfortable it was. I said to the pastor, I said, I, I spoke to your treasure tonight. He goes, when? I said, during preaching. He said, that is my treasure. And I said, he's battling you too, isn't he? He is battling me. Thank you very much. So um, no one has to tell you that. Ushers, please come. Our last night to give. And our church family I really would like you to help us. A lot of airfare, a lot of hotel expense, and a lot of various things that we go through in a week's time. And if you could do your very best uh, to give a huge, huge offering tonight. We're going to get you up pretty quickly here, Brother Hudson. Our Father, I thank you so much for this week. It's been such a blessing. I look forward to this last message. I look forward to the fellowship tonight. And I pray your blessing upon the offering. God, please, especially to my people, right now, God, move on their heart that they could give an extra huge gift. I'm certain right now you're speaking to some of my members. And though they give and give and give, may they give online right now or may they write a check. And they put a large gift in tonight to help us as we invest in the great men and women of God in this nation. In Jesus' name, amen.
my soul was astray from the heavenly way. I was wretched and vile as could be, but my Savior in love, he gave me peace from above. When he reached down his hand for me, I was near to despair when he came to me there and he showed me complete when he reached down his hand for me and how my heart does rejoice when I hear his sweet voice in the tempest to him I then flee And just keep walking, if you will. I'm not going to have you testify. I see you coming in the auditorium. He's been playing the guitar over there. I'll get you up in a moment, Brother Hudson. Brother Raymond, two years ago, just I'll ask you maybe a question or two, uh, came to our church. His life was a mess. Uh, a rock and roller at sec second grade in an abusive, terrible, awful home. He became a drunk. Yep. Second grade. Yep. And um, a life of, of just fights. You were a fighter, weren't you? And uh, <laughs> he got in a rock band eventually, and they became good, and they were the setup group for the big groups. And, uh, and rolled his car so many times on these roads around here. And he looked up. I, I, do I have it right? You looked up a Baptist church. Mm -hmm. Where, right, where was the first Baptist church, the nearest one, showed up for you? Wasn't that Japan? Well, it actually, there was none I could find open near my house. It was actually a Presbyterian church, but I guess God had other plans. And I looked up a website for a church near my house that I could walk to. It was during COVID, so a lot of them were closed down. And I read their website a bunch of times and figured, okay, that's where I'm going to go check it out. So after a couple hours looking at their stuff, I closed the laptop and had a sandwich came back to read it some more and I opened my laptop and I saw the North Valley website on my laptop. <laughs> and I recognize it because I do work kitty corner from here a lot as a job site. I started reading and I realized this church 
leaves exactly like I do. So I started looking around it and read everything they had on there and started watching the videos of Pastor here. 10 or 12 hours went by and I was still watching videos. <laughs> and I decided to click on the contact button and I sent a message saying, I'm thinking of coming to your church. About maybe 20 minutes later, I got a message back from Brother Martinez. And he said, I come on down, come early in the morning, Sunday morning, and I'll meet you in the commons building, we'll have breakfast. Then we'll go to the service. So I came and I had no idea who to look for. I pulled in the driveway and I was a little overwhelmed by all the people and cars here. And eventually, I don't want to take too long, so I just kind of got out, parked, and started walking up. And there was a guy looking at me coming around the corner of the Commons building. And I started thinking, why is that guy looking at me? <laughs> you know, for the Martinez, I was, to be honest, I was expecting a Hispanic guy. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Which obviously he's not. He's not? No. Well, oh. I question that sometimes. I do too. I question a lot of things. <laughs> we both do, don't we? That's right. Yeah. He so called he, your name, didn't he? Yes, he did. He called my name and turned out he was looking for me. And I kind of wondered how he knew my name since we'd never met. Took me in the Commons building, went to the Lifeline class, and people were very nice and welcoming. And I felt right at home instantly learned a lot in the class that morning and a young man named Jonathan from the college had brought me into the service and we sat in the fifth row right there and pastor I believe was preaching on foolish choices of men I believe it was that day first of all I had my mind blown by the choir when I came out I wasn't used to that sort of music and it was better than anything I've ever heard and service ended that day I kind of stood up and figured, well, I guess I'll go home now. And I turned to Brother Martinez, who was standing right there, and asked me, so if you died today, do you know to go to heaven? And I told him, well, I'm working on it. And he said, well, it doesn't work that way. And he explained <laughs> how it works. <laughs> and after all the years I had of something missing in my life, knowing that feeling, what about that? all of a sudden I realized this is what was missing. <laughs> I tried all kinds of things, even figured at one point, all I need to do is get a Bible and read it. That didn't take care of it. Couldn't understand it. And then he led me to the front right, front row right here with uh, Brother Sly. And he led me to Christ right there in the front row. And then Brother Martinez came back, explained about baptism. I told him, let's, let's do it right now. So I ended up walking in the building, feeling like something's missing. Got saved and baptized and never had that feeling again. I'm here all the time. Praise God. Raymond, do you believe in going to Sunday school? Oh, yes. Sunday morning? Yes. Sunday night? Yes, sir. Wednesday night? Yes, sir. Soul winning? Yes, sir. Men's prayer? Yes, sir. Bus mechanic? Yes, sir. Yeah, you see, when you get the real dose, you want it all. All of it. <laughs> That's right. I, 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 I wasn't planning on this, but you just come he, he's over here playing this guitar tonight. I saw you back there when he reached down his hand. He wrote a book, he reached way uh, <laughs> and the book, what's your, it's about 400 some pages. My yeah. wife could put it down, read the whole thing. Yeah. What, what's it called? Grace Through It All. Grace Through It All. Through drugs, mm -hmm. drink, alcohol, beat up. Yep. A dad who's right next door over here, we used to be a state hospital, uh, schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. A stepdad that beat him to death. Just about. And the grace of God. That's right. Sure love you. Praise God. God bless you. Let you go that way. Isn't that wonderful? And uh, there's, a, there's a hurting world out here. We, I could, it, it just happened this way. It's just the last couple of years since COVID. We're getting testimonies like that all the time. Uh, I heard a few the other night. And just such a blessing. Brother Tony, I love him so much. He's always helped me. He's always been a blessing to me. And I like that he's direct. And I think our people like it. We live in such a soft day. But he's going to tell us like it is. You'll love it tonight. How many have never heard Brother Hudson preach before? Let me see. Oh, you're in for a treat. Come on, my brother. You're at home here. Well, amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Take your Bibles, and we're going to use them some tonight. I think we're going to turn to two different texts. First Samuel, Second Samuel, chapter number eleven, and uh, and then we're going to turn over in a little while over here to 
to Galatians chapter 2. And if that text makes any of y'all nervous, then you're not a Bible lover. Amen. Amen. We love the Word of God. And uh, I've got all these notes. I used to use no notes whatsoever, and then I started coming over here and watching Brother Cooper preach. And uh, somebody help me, man. I took a, a notebook with me tonight. I don't know where I'm going first. I got three or four sermons up here. And. Uh, Brother Bobby Robertson was preaching one time. We were preaching together. He's on the platform, and he had just a stack of them, brother, in the back of his Bible. I mean, there's a stack of outlines. And I said, "Which one of them you going to preach tonight?" He said, "I won't need any of them if God shows up." <laughs> and uh, and I hope God does show up. And I've enjoyed you honoring my daddy. A lot of people know my daddy. They don't know my granddaddy. There's a lot you don't know, but my my, my granddaddy was a great man. Most of you probably don't know that he he was the one that warned of the sinking of the Titanic. He, he was a warn, he would give warning, he, he would holler out, said, that iceberg's going to sink that ship. And that iceberg's going to sink that ship. But nobody would listen, they just threw him out of the theater. Somebody said, hey man, right there. <laughs> That's funny. I had y'all on that, man. <laughs> but I want to communicate tonight. And uh, sometimes it's hard to communicate. Man, we've heard such good preaching. I'm glad we're not competing. And uh, we're on the same side. And, but I heard about two twin boys born down in Louisiana. And they, they named them Huda and Duda. And oh, oh, Huda, he. He stuttered all the time, and I'm not making fun of people that stutter, but he could, he, 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 he could hardly, especially when he got, got excited. And they were coming home from school, and uh, a log truck run slap cadaver over Duda and killed him right there. I mean, he just took off running to the house. And he, 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 he said, my mama, ma, mama, mama, li, li, listen, to, she said, sing it, son, sing it. He said, someone died at school today, do-da, do-da. Yeah. I'm trying. I got to look to my wife for approval on that. One, one fellow was getting married. It was a few minutes before the service, the ceremony. Man, he was just shaking all over, nervous. I'm nervous. I mean, I've been sweating since I got walked in the building. And just nerves. And he was sweating all over. And he, man, he come out of the restroom, and the preacher saw him. Said, "Son, said, calm down. Said, everything's gonna be all right. Said, you're gonna be some nervous. He said, I ain't nervous. I ain't nervous. He said, then why are you coming out of the ladies' restroom for then? You know, nervous. <laughs> God help us. Chapter eleven. And uh, you can stand if you want to. You don't have to stand to reverence God's Word. Or you couldn't listen to the radio and hear preaching. I was in North Georgia preaching up in Gainesville, Georgia. And you got to beware of the, of the leaven of the Pharisees. Uh, I do like to stand. I don't mind standing. But I was in the midst of some Pharisees. And they wanted to catch me doing something wrong. And so I just started reading my text. And they all jumped up, you know, like, we're going to catch the evangelist. He's, he didn't have a stand. And so I thought, well, that's, and they, they really distracted. Well, what they wanted was attention on them. Look how spiritual we are. And uh, so I said, well, I said, uh, hold up just a minute. I see y'all like to stand. I said, let's turn to Psalms 119. <laughs> Beware, be, Pharisees like titles. Pharisees like that title, Dr. So and so. Dr. So and so. They want to know who sits in Moses' seat. They can't fellowship with you if their favorite preacher is not your favorite preacher. My daddy uh, pastored in Atlanta, Georgia, when he was in his youth and until he passed. 
he left there in the mid 70s and took the editorship of the Soul of the Lord. But while he was there, he met a man named Berman Cape, who uh, is the predecessor to Brother Ricky Gravely there at Bible Baptist Church. They had asked him, said, Who's your favorite preacher? My dad answered, He said, Berman Cape's my favorite preacher. And they, 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 who is he? You know, that, that bother, it bothers people if you don't like who they like. That's Phariseeism. Now, I'm, I'm against everything. You understand? I'm so narrow minded. I believe a gnat could stand on the bridge of my nose and kick both eyeballs at the same time. But Pharisees are more interested with the outside than they are the inside. Pharisees don't preach on jealousy and envy much, they mean malice. They just preach on what they can see. There's more to it than that. Let's beware of those Pharisees. So, let's stand together and we won't stand all night. Chapter 11, verse 1, And it came to pass that after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass that in the evening tide, that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. Notice these three words. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Our Heavenly Father, we're living in a day where silence from the pulpit concerning crucial issues is almost deafening. And tonight as I preach, I yield myself to you the best way I know how. From the top of my head, the sole of my feet, it is my desire to please you. And you can do this, so I ask you to do this. Guard my lips from saying anything that should not be said. I'm asking you, sweet Holy Ghost, to restrain me from saying anything that ought not be said. You're powerful and I yield myself to you. At the same time I pray you give me backbone and courage to say everything that I ought to say in such a crucial hour of compromise, such a crucial hour of ecumenicalism, such a crucial hour of weakness, and Lord, help us to develop some strength in these last days. You said strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. And I pray tonight you'd revive us again. Speak through me. And I do want to thank you for what's already been preached. And there's not, not anything that I've heard that I've disagreed with. And I thank you, Lord, that you spoke to my heart, spoke to my wife and daughter's heart, and the thousands by way of the Internet access. But help us tonight to leave this meeting with a determination to have an impact in this old dark hour of the Laodicean church age. Let us leave here on fire for you, for we ask it now in the name that's above every name, in Jesus' name, and may long live old time religion till you come again. Yeah. Amen. And you can be seated. <clears throat> Charles Haddon Spurgeon made a quote. I've got a book of his quotes. One of the most unrecognized quotes that he ever made. You don't see it published much, but it was this. That a man seldom repents of silence. A man seldom repents of silence. We have a whole lot of admission today. There's preaching there at the touch of a finger. You can look at anybody you want to look at, any style of preaching you want to hear, any denomination you want to hear, any doctrinal twist, any, any vein jangling or any swerving. You can find it at the internet access, probably holding in your lap, holding in your hand tonight. And there's a whole lot of omission. Can I say that what's being said and preached a lot of it's good. A lot of the crowd that does not bear our title, Baptist, we're Baptist. We're independent, fundamental, premillennial missionary. King James, we're not ecumenicalist. And we believe in biblical separation. 
Now look at me just a minute. Separation is as much a Bible doctrine as the blood atonement is. Not just holiness. I'm not just talking about personal separation. I'm talking about ecclesiastical separation. And there's a whole lot of preaching going on that's good and it's not all bad what they're saying. It's just what they're not saying. It's what they leave out of the message. We don't have options as men of God. We're supposed to be faithful. The Bible said, moreover, a steward is required that he be found faithful. And we don't get to pick and choose. I mean, we got to preach the whole counsel of God, whether it's received or rejected. And here's a man the Bible tells us about. I don't know who he was. I've got an idea, Brother Ricky. He was uh, in chapter 12. He might have been Nathan. And, and I got a right to my opinion like the internet folks have a right to theirs. Somebody say amen. Now, I'm not going to say it was Nathan, but I'm not going to say it wasn't. Because when nobody else would say anything, David had all kind of advisors. He's the king. He had all kind of men that were subordinate to him that he could command to do, and they were there to watch, to help, to to be a, a wall of protection against the king, to keep him from making a mess. There was one stood there when he inquired of the woman, verse 3, and one said, is not this Bathsheba? One. One said. John the Baptist said, I'm the voice of one. Not a big crowd's going to stand in these last days. Elijah said, I, even I only. Now we understand there's 7,000 that hadn't bent the knee or hadn't kissed yet the, 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 the image, but where were they? Where's the 7,000 when you need them? Somebody say amen. They're on their Facebook. Amen. <laughs> Criticizing Elijah for fighting the enemy. Criticizing Elijah for being too extreme by cutting off the 850 false prophets' heads. You know, he's taking it a little too far now. But he stood by himself. Y'all know the story. Jehoshaphat's talking with Ahab. We better go to war. And he said, well, ask the prophets. And the prophets, oh, yeah, yeah, it's going to be fine. And he said, is there any ovens? Any ovens, that's in our vernacular, that means there's anybody else. He said, well, there's this one old boy named Micaiah. But I hate him. I can't stand him. The question was proposed, I mean, is there any, and he, he, said, he said, there is yet one. Now, now look at me, if you're going to stand against and stand for against the wrong things and for the right things, don't think there's going to be an entourage around you. <laughs> I, honest to God, I mean, I believe there's these brethren today, they're so, they're so dependent upon me and my gang. I mean, they got to have somebody. Somebody to like them on Facebook. Somebody to give their approval. But if you're going to stand for long, you'll have to, you'll have to learn to stand a long. And here's a man who speaks up, and I'm sure there's those that are surrounding him that are probably saying, man, I don't know if I'd say that. Because the stand that he made, the statement that he spoke, and by the way, that's our warfare. Our weapons are not carnal, but they're spiritual. So they're pulling down a stronghold. What we're involved in is preaching, saying something. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come, and it has come, when they not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust. Lust is a desire for the forbidden. There's, there's, some, there's some boundaries we have by the Bible. It's not set by a pope of the independent movement. There is none. But there's Bible boundaries. Come out from among them. Happy ye separate, thus saith the toy Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you, and I'll be a father, and you'll be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. But he said, man, you've got to preach it. Amen. Preach the word. Amen. For the time will come where they'll not endure sound doctrine. They'll make up their own rules. Double-minded, have it their own way. By the way, you can't have it both ways. I'm going to take my time and preach tonight. Amen. 
has come, but they're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Man, you take a stand, all the teachers come with their hackles up. I mean, they go to making their little comments on social media. Amen, when you take a stand. But this man said something at the right time. You know, really, if I could title my message, I know it's not grammatically correct, but it'll work on my North Carolina brethren. I would like to preach for about two and a half hours on this right here. Ain't nobody saying nothing. Amen. I know it's nobody is saying anything, but double negatives work real good to make your point. Amen. What I meant to say was, hey, it's 2024. It, we're in the Laodicean church age and the sun is setting on this thing. Hey, and ain't nobody saying nothing. But here's one man, the Bible said, and one said. One of them said, hey, this is Bathsheba. I want you to think with me in this introduction. I'm going to get to the message. I got three of them. When you take a stand, most of the time it'll be a singular stand. I'm learning and I've got a good family. I've got daughters and a son in church. But I'm learning that, man, you can't always count on your family. You can't always count on church members. Paul said at the first accusation, no man stood with me. But he said, notwithstanding, praise God, the Lord stood with me. And I'd rather be standing with God than standing with the crowd. Amen. I, I mean, we're, we're dealing in, in an hour of, of faith and practice that's being violated right in front of our eyes and ain't nobody saying nothing. Can I say that it's a stressful statement? He's got David here and David's guards I mean, don't you know David had some pretty good agents surrounding him? I mean, he, he, had, he had some bad boys, 137 mighty men, and every one of them would whoop you like a barefoot stepchild. <laughs> and he's going to speak up in objection. It's stressful. I'll never forget it. It'll be stressful on your family if you'll stand. Preachers are taking, taking the, the, the soft way out in this hour because with, with the plea of, well, I, I don't want to put my family under that duress. It was back in the late 80s. I'll never forget, I was at Liberty University and uh, I was there on scholarship and Dr. Curtis Hudson, y'all heard of him. <laughs> he had a paper at that time, had over a half a million subscribers. I don't know what it's down to now. But people used to read the sword. And man, I remember coming from our mailboxes and man, all these preacher boys was looking through this paper and they was looking at me hard. And I go, back at you, hoss. I got a sharp boker tree band in my pocket. Don't look too long. I cut you down like a weed. They, 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 Brother Ricky, they're looking at me going, well, what's going on? Then I got to the mailbox and opened the mailbox and on the cover it said the dangerous direction of Jerry Falwell <laughs> and Tim Lee. Amen. Right below it said ecumenical gathering in Jacksonville. Are y'all okay? <laughs> ecumenical, a round robin of Southern Baptist and Independent Baptist blending together. This was in the 80s. I was on the campus. Daddy didn't call me and give me a heads up. <laughs> now, Tony, just want you to know I'm fixing to, I'm fixing to split her down the middle here. We're going to see who's really a Bible-believing fundamentalist or one of them pseudo, one of them quasi. Amen. We're going to see who's going to stand or who's going to, who's going to yoke up with that other crowd. I, he didn't give me any. I didn't get a letter through the mail. I didn't, he, I, he didn't send smoke signals. 
All I got was hard looks from everybody on the campus. And by the way, I was Jerry Falwell's bodyguard at the time. That was a warm welcome next time I saw him. But now we want to have a stand without any cost. We want to say, we want to say nothing because if we say anything, I mean, if we name, now you can generically say it, I mean, but as long as you just categorize it in big chunks, but when you go to narrowing it down and naming out what's going on in these last days. You know, Romans, the last chapter, let's turn over there. I ain't got through with this Samuel yet, but we're coming back to it. Romans chapter 16. Y'all got a King James? If you don't, just throw what you've got on the ground look on with somebody that does. <laughs> Verse 17, chapter 16, I beseech ye, brethren, mark them that cause divisions and offenses. Why are we always the one they're saying is dividing? When they're leaving us, when this millennial crowd, these younger generation, these third generation Christians are leaving us and they call us the dividers. Said Markham, that, uh, that uh, divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, how to avoid them. For they are such that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, they're, per, they're professional manipulators. They know how to just say the right words. They deceive the hearts of the simple. Y'all listen to me. Markham. Markham. I've got some doctrine been taught me. It's called ecclesiastical separation. And it's been taught me. I'm a King James man. I was taught this. You don't have to like this. I'm going to preach it anyway now. And I'm not rubbing shoulders with somebody that rubs shoulders, but somebody rubs shoulders that's ordaining women preachers. I meant to say I'm not, I'm not rubbing shoulders with somebody that rubs shoulders. It's rubbing shoulders with somebody that endorses the ESV. And I'm not rubbing shoulders with somebody that rubs shoulders with some. You say that's 33rd degree. So call it what you want to. It's called come out from among them ism. It's called come out from among them. It's what Dr. Seitler taught me. You say, oh, he wasn't that bad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, his grandson might have left and joined a Southern Baptist church, but I'm not following him. I'm following Seitler because I was taught. Here's how Seitler was about Southern Baptists. I mean, I couldn't believe it. He, 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 he said, he, he, now, now, now we've got a children's home at Tabernacle and said it's independent Baptist children's home. He said, if you have Southern Baptist children, send them down to Sevierville. I'm talking about orphans. <laughs> y'all, y'all saying we're taking it too far. Look at me now. Y'all died on that one. Hey, I don't know much about fishing. When I get hung on a stump, I just keep circling until I pull off, praise God. Hey, man, right there. Hey, hey, somebody got to draw a line somewhere. Mark them. Mark them. It's stressful. Nobody, I'd like to preach that happy message too. Hey, man, three steps to a better self-image, all of that stuff. And I wish there was not all the brother said about, you know, all this, all this gossip. Well, let me say that apologetics is not gossiping. And to speak evil of no man is to intend to hurt somebody. But earnestly contending for the faith, you're going to have to say something. And what I meant to say, my text tonight is, ain't nobody saying nothing. The papers ain't saying nothing, Brother Patrick. Don't you judge me, Brother Patrick. I'll judge you back right now. Amen. The papers ain't saying nothing. The colleges, they got long-haired people coming in preaching creationism. Somebody help me with an NIV Bible. You say, I wouldn't do that. I was invited to preach. I'll say what I want to say. Amen, friend. Very few is going to say anything, but the Bible said, but one said, but one said, but one said, one said, David, this ain't right. It's strenuous. You start 
standing in this hour. You know, I'm just going to mind my business in my church. You can't do that and be God called. Your people have the internet access whether you know how to use it or not. I'm one that doesn't. But they know how to use it and they see all that. And all these rock star young preachers, these, they're, they're sucking our children in. To their strobe light, airplane light, blue light. My deacons told me those old pink pastel lights is what they have in these, in these strip tea clubs. I don't know, that's what my deacons told me. <laughs> Same color. Their buildings look like a warehouse. Got exposed ductwork up in the ceiling. Painted black smoke coming off the floor. It's preaching time now. I'm talking about, man, it's strenuous. It's so strenuous it'll affect you physically. Not just your family, but it'll affect you. It'll affect your flesh. And if you stay straight and preach, it'll affect your future. But I'd rather have God than invitations. It'll cut you off with a lot of the brethren because they say, well, we don't know what he's going to say. Hey, I'd rather be known for what I am going to be say than be invited somewhere for what I'm not going to say. Amen, friend. Can I preach what God's, oh, I am going to, anyhow. I'll never forget this, Brother Gravely. Before you was born, my daddy said, we're going to go hear a preacher tonight, Tony. He was a Southern Baptist preacher named Vance Havner. All of you have read his books. If you hadn't, you need to get them. Had them good old, old country one-liners, Southern one-liners. He's from North Carolina. Great preacher, had a great, he was a, he was a defender. Yeah. I'll never forget it, man. We got in the car and we were riding down the road and going out to the country. I think it was down there around between Georgia. There's a place called, it's between Georgia. You know where it's at. And you know, we were going, that's where you at. We, we're in between. <laughs> but between Georgia. And this church on the side of the road, we went to that church, gravel parking lot. And Daddy kept talking about, you're going to hear Vance Havner. And Daddy had said, and tears get in his eyes. He said, he's one of the best that you ever heard. Then I got there to hear Vance Havner, about four cars in the parking lot. And I'm thinking, Vance Havner, we're going to see somebody call down on fire. Vance Havner. Daddy said, man, he's, and Daddy went in there, man, he had his Bible, he was excited. He, while that man preached, there might have been 10, 11 people in the building, and he wept. My daddy sat there and wept. I wasn't even saved, but I knew something was going on. When we got back out in the car, I said, Daddy, I thought this preacher was like, he said, son, son, he is a great one. But said, when you take a stand, sometimes it's lonely. Sometimes it's lonely. Sometimes when you're standing on a platform like this, and you think the brethren are with you, but you mention ecclesiastical separation, it's like it's not in the Bible. Like somebody cut that page out. There's boundaries. There's people we don't need to yoke up with. There's places. Dangerous friend. I say this, when did he make this? The moment that he made this statement, it was a time of neutral contentment. Look what he said, in the days when kings went to war, he stepped up when people were just doing nothing. We have more activity going on, and I, I'm, not, I'm not grouping all churches together, but I'm saying as a whole, there's more activity going on today in Baptist churches, more functions going on. We've got something on the internet every day, got some kind of announcement, and with less results than we've ever seen. Because we're content. We're content to go Sunday after Sunday with nobody being saved. Somebody needs to say something about a church who can turn their back on the bus ministry. Who can turn their back on door to door soul winning? Who can turn their back on a Sunday school? What about that going to highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house be? Suffer little children. Uh, suffer little. That means make a way. Suffer little children to come unto me. Had forbid them not, uh, for such is the kingdom of heaven. We've gotten comfortable doing nothing. People got comfortable saying nothing. 
David's laid up on his bed at evening tide. Evening tide's when the sun goes down. He was getting up when the sun went down. He must have been working third shift. Somebody help me. It was a day of notable confusion. Notable confusion. Here's a day where David the king is going to take one of his soldiers' wives. He's going to conceive a, a son of a soldier. That, this, that ain't the way it's supposed to be. Nathan said, David, there was this man down the road had a little lamb. David, there was this man down the road had a little lamb and they raised him like their daughter. And a rich man came by and he wouldn't even kill his own lamb. He had a whole flock full and he took that little poor man's lamb and he killed it and fed his guest. And David said, who is that man? He said, thou art the man. Thou art the man. A day of notable confusion. Things are so confused now. We're blaming, we're blaming the messenger for the problem. Everybody sides with, the, with those that have, have, have been out of the will of God, who've broken the rules of God. They side with those who've erred, not to those who expose the error. You don't have to be sinless to preach against sin. Amen. God used a donkey one time. He used a rooster one time. Amen. You don't have to be perfect to hold up the standard. You know, you can fall down and get back up. Get on it now. I'm on ya. Hey, hey, hey. Well, look who, look who called it. Well, look who called I'm telling you what's going on today. Somebody's got to say something. Why don't some good men say something, you know? Why don't some of those been trained and taught to say something? Say something? Why don't some periodicals say something? Amen. Amen. Oh, it's quiet, but I ain't, this, that, I ain't got through a sermon number one yet. The moment, it was a time of national calamity. It, it become a mockery. Israel was becoming a mockery. We've got a king who's going out here and marrying, get, getting stealing wives from his soldiers and sending, his, sending a letter. They sent a letter by, by Joab. David sent a letter, and that letter haunted David. I believe that messed up the nation. That letter, that letter had old David bound by Joab the rest of his ministry. The nation of Israel, hey, was absolutely plagued with trouble after trouble. I mean, the house of David was overrun with trouble after trouble, all because he did not listen to the messenger. That ain't your wife. That's your eyes, wife. He didn't just say it's it's your eye. He didn't just say it's Bathsheba. He he said it's her wife. Amen. Amen. What he said was a revelation. Some people don't know. That's why we have to tell them. We can't just run around with our head in the sand. I don't see anything wrong with. You got to be taught some things are wrong with it. You got to be shown the Bible. You got to be explained the truth. And well, I just don't see anything wrong. How you got to be? By the way, preachers ought to say something about this immodest dress. How long? How long do you have to be saved, bound before you quit dressing like Madonna and Lady Gaga, and bringing that junk on the platform? Preachers, you don't run their homes, but you run the platform. There's lots of ways you can say, you know, preacher, when she starts coming up with that miniskirt on. There's ways you can say, you say, Dr. Treber's got his way, you know. <laughs> we do it a little different at home. We say, uh-uh. <laughs> Ma'am, ain't no way. <laughs> Have you lost your ever-loving mind? Hey, hey, over my dead body. Somebody help me. We won't say no. We're saying nothing. Well, we got to give them leaning room. Got to give them growing room. Got to give them leaning room. Man, there's some of this crowd leaning so far that they're about to lay down. 
Dr. Tom Malone told my daddy, they was preaching at a Southern Baptist church over there in the, in the, in the early 80s. This man was saying, I'm coming out of the convention. We're having a, bi- having a bus conference. And he ran buses. They had standards. In fact, I dated his daughter a little while at Liberty. And I mean, man, good, good home, good family. I mean, King James only. They, they were, you know, by name only, you know, Southern Baptist. That's what they said. By the way, let me stop and get me back on this. That name only. Somebody ought to say something about that. That's like me putting a sign around my neck, I am a homosexual. I am a homosexual. Well, everybody knows me knows I ain't no homosexual. It's just a sign. You know, it's just a sign. It's, you know, but words mean something. And what you take off your sign means something. Well, it says, it says, uh, it says Emmanuel Church. But if you read our doctrinal statement, we're free will. Well, that's good enough for me not to go. I'm not yoking up with an Arminian. Might as well go to a Church of God church. Don't get mad. Get, he asked me to preach. Don't bow your head. I'm not ready to pray yet. I believe in everlasting life. I, if, if, if I didn't, I wouldn't be a Baptist. We believe in eternal life. We believe in eternal life. We don't rub shoulders with crowd who cast a doubt on the Bible. The Bible said, and I give unto them temporary life. No, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's what the Bible said. It's a revelation to some. What he said was a restraint. They may not receive our words, Brother Darrell, but the words are recorded. I'm going to give an account not for what my people do, but for what my people hear. I'm going to give an account for this opportunity here. It sobers me. I don't think this generation even thinks about the Bema seat. Because if you don't play by the rules, you don't get anything. If you strive, you got to strive lawfully. Amen. Bible's got boundaries how we do this thing. There's the right way, it's called the Bible way. There's the wrong way, it's the world's way. Amen. Amen. It was rebuke. Two thirds of your preaching ministry is to reprove and rebuke. It's 2 Timothy 4. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove and rebuke, then exhort. Now, I'm for camp meeting messages. I'm for happy. We need some happy. But two-thirds of a pastor's responsibility is to bust hide. I'm talking about preaching ought to be, I'm talking preaching ought to be, I'm talking about hide on the wall, amen, guts on the floor, and blood in the cracks, praise God. Now it's a little sermonette for a Christianette dressed like a majorette, driving that Corvette, smoking that cigarette. Help me now. And the ecumenical evangelist coming by. I'm tired of these evangelists come preach all these happy messages. Making friends with all my people and I'm the bad guy. Hey man. Somebody ought, to, somebody ought to come in and back what you preach. Stand where you stand. Hey man. Why he said it? Well, I mean, it's required. It's required. Preach the word. Not the part you like. That's plural. There's responsibility involved. He felt like if I don't do it, who? Let me ask y'all something. If y'all won't go back home and say something, who's going to? Who's going to call out this crowd? who's like the Pied Piper leading all our young people. Oh, it's not all of them. Yeah, I'm telling you, we're losing them. We've losing in our families. We lose our family members to this new bunch of, this neo bunch of left-leaning evangelical. They're, they're evangelical. They're not, they're not fundamentalist. They're not leaving to, they're not, they're pseudo. They're quasi. They're not even real. They don't even want the term fundamental. As weak as it's getting, I'm, I'm sticking with Bible-believing Baptists. Somebody say amen. amen. This thing's getting so weak, watered down now. I, I'm a Bible-believing Baptist, praise God. 
Thank you, Brother Darrell. I ain't even got to the message yet. I'm coming to the message. How he told them. His method. The Bible says he's going forth and weepeth. Can I tell you that some of these men that are leaders in our circles that I've known for years, been in the yoke with, I've wept. There's two or three preachers in this room I've called you and cried and said, I wouldn't have that man. And I wouldn't run with that crowd. And I've wept over it. I'm, I'm thinking of two right now in this building that I've called and wept and I said, I think you're making a bad choice. Your predecessor fought that. And did I say I'm not going to rub shoulders with the Calvinist either? Amen. I ain't getting around that crowd that want sovereignty, sovereignty, sovereignty. All they want to talk sovereignty, sovereignty. So we know what sovereignty is. Sovereignty is God doing what He wants to, when He wants to, the way He wants to, and He doesn't need your permission. Sovereignty has nothing to do with unconditional election. Sovereignty has nothing to do, look at me, with irresistible grace. That's false doctrine. That's false doctrine. You might as well, you might as well baptize babies. You might as well baptize babies. It's false doctrine. Dead yeah, man, am I, am I okay? It's too late to say anything now. I've wept with men in this room and I said, and I mean, and I, please don't, are you gonna hurt yourself? It's not good. Well, you should never call anybody out until you talk to them first. Well, what about when you've talked to them for 20 years? After 20 years saying, man, look, you you better back off that crowd. Let me just say C.T. Townsend ain't got nothing to offer our young people. I wouldn't send a poodle dog to learn how to bark, learn how to jump, but to go to a C.T. Townsend youth conference. And, and hey man, don't you buy it. You say, I don't know who he is. I hope you don't. Now they all getting nervous. Hey man. Suave and cool. Contemporary music. Play one, one I'll fly away song and then about 10 of them other Ya ya wa wa. Amen. But I've wept with them. And I've warned them. You say, Who are you? Are you the authority? No, but I've been around a long, long time. And I've been taught something. And I'm supposed to say something. And one said, and one said, this ain't right. This ain't right. And when you weep and when you warn, then you better watch. Because what will happen, the same thing that they're falling prey to, you'll fall prey to. The same very thing. Well, you'll say, well, not me. Oh, yeah, you better be careful. You get softer you get older. You get softer. Most of the time, preachers get softer. And when their children have children, then the standards they had for their children soften on their grandchildren. It doesn't happen some of the time. Hey, it happens all the time. You better be watching. You better keep your hand on the pulse. You better be, hey, I'm telling you, because when, when, you, when you stand and when you say and when you speak and when you stand for God in a day of apostasy, in a day of apathy, in a day of audacity, I can't believe these 40-year-old preachers, they think they're the final authority on preaching now. They all got a, any 30-year-old, 40-year-old man quoting himself, ain't he full of pride? 30-year-old quoting their self. Honestly, you just don't know how stupid you look. Dr. Howells told me, I was preaching up there, and he said, uh, before we died, he said, I want to talk to you in office. He said, let me give you some words for advice for the future. Don't write books. He was telling me. He said, just stick to preaching. 
Let me help y'all. Best thing for you to do is go back and say something. I guarantee you, you won't have to post it. If you'll say something stout, if you'll say something true, it'll get on there. <laughs> if you'll say something, friend, that rubs the world's grain the wrong way, if you'll stand for God, you won't have to post a blessed fired thing. They'll make sure it gets on there for them. They'll make sure where to watch. That's message one. Turn with me to Galatians. Well, I just tell you now, I just don't believe in calling names. Verse 11, chapter 2, Galatians. I know you're going to say, well, that's not written to the church. Well, you probably went to PBI. Somebody help me. Where I wished I'd have went. Somebody say amen. amen. Verse number 11. But when Peter was in Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Now what that means was he was wrong. You deep Greek students help me. He's to be blamed. So if he's to be blamed, he must have been wrong. When, you, when you're preaching for anything, anywhere, all them boat rides, I don't understand all that being spiritual. I don't understand all this boat, getting on this boat with a bunch of singers, ain't got no clothes on. A bunch of 40, 45 year old women laid out there, on, getting sunbathed in a bikini, singing in a quartet. Member of Assembly of God. You don't have to like this, you lump this, friend. If you think I'm scared of you, you really are wrong. Amen. I was preaching before I'll come in here and I'll be preaching when I leave out of here. I, 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 listen, I'm not running with that crowd. How did that get in here? Oh, he told him, said he was wrong. Oh, yeah, that, that's, hey, listen, that, that, all that's worldliness. Christians ought to live separate. Lady ought to look like a lady. Man ought to look like a man. Some of you boys around here need to get a deeper voice. Somebody say amen. amen. See what you taking. Amen. He withstood him to his face. Now notice verse 12. For before that certain came from James and he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come he withdrew and separated himself. Fearing them which were of the circumcision, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. What you do, what we let get by, who we give a card to, it's going to affect you. When we start giving the body, well, he gets by. Well, imagine this Paul talking to this fellow. He said, he said, for when I saw that he walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, he said, I said, they're going to get real critical. That's just the gospel. No, it's, it, I'm telling you, the traditions of men. We're to mark those that won't follow those so that they can be ashamed. He said, the gospel, I said unto Peter, therefore, he said, before them all, underline that phrase. Where did he say it at? Well, he'd done been, to, he, hey, well, I guess he didn't get to, you know, have a private conversation. They don't tell you all this liberal crowd about how many times they've been confronted, how many messages they've let wall, what, what Dr. Seitler preached when they was a boy, and Mother Mays preached, and Oliver B. Green preached, and Dr. Howells preached, and Daddy preached, and they made, took a stand. They don't tell you about all that. They just let that run off their back. Like they hadn't been told. And then all of a sudden, Peter's the bad guy. Well, he is. Paul's the one who's standing right. And he said to him, Peter, before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as the, do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews do? Y'all staying here? Well, I wouldn't call, if that had been today on the internet, Paul put on Facebook, Peter, you ought not be doing that. If he was to put on his Instagram, his YouTube channel and say, hey, Peter, 
That's not right. And it, y'all getting quiet. Peter, that's not right what you're doing. In fact, it's, uh, you're to be blamed. I can see it on the Facebook. Who are you? I can see all that. Paul, do you think you're better than Peter? Do you know how many people got saved on Pentecost? Have you ever preached and seen 3,000 bodies? Who else is going to get to preach it but Billy Graham? And he wouldn't. If you got to have 3,000 souls saved on one day to be qualified to rebuke and reprove, then who's going to say anything? I can see it on, can't y'all see it? Can everybody see it on the internet? Uh, You sound mean spirited. I mean, man, man, you should have done this in private and then go to telling young preachers, well, I wouldn't sit under a pastor who calls out people in public. Well, then you wouldn't sit under Paul, would you? You wouldn't sit under Jesus. Amen. Can y'all, can y'all see him? Well, <laughs> we all make mistakes. So I got to quit preaching on sin because I get mad every once in a while. I won't tell you all the rest of them. Don't you see that? You can't stand for anything because you're mean spirited. It ain't none of, well, we all serve the same Lord. Don't you know he, he's a headline speaker? at the conferences. Don't you know everybody likes him? Don't you know he's one of the best preachers we got? Talent's not a qualification. I wouldn't do that. You want to happen when you compromise? Then you've got to have to reach a place of character. Your character's going to get marred. Because then you've got to lie for your compromise. Then you start lying for your compromise. Then you start trying to cover up your compromise. And you start, he that diggeth the pit falleth therein. Can I help y'all? I think if y'all want to leave, you can. I'm going to stay here and preach a little while. I, all this preaching, I've been wanting to say something. Somebody ought to say something. And my message tonight is. Ain't nobody saying nothing. Ain't nobody saying nothing about it. My daddy died yesterday, 29 years ago, with the burden of ecumenicalism bearing down. And I've had the older preachers who fought him. That BBF fought daddy over Jerry Falwell. I had had John Rollins call me at 97 years old and say, Brother Tony, I want to tell you your daddy was right. He said, I'm going to go the other side. He said, before I leave, I want you to know your daddy was right about Jerry Falwell. But he fought him. But I believe daddy died early grave. Never smoked a cigarette, never drank a beer. But the stress and the pressure of standing, standing. Y'all don't know him. Willard Thomas, not Willard Thomas, but his brother, what's his brother's name? Edgar. Brother Edgar, one of our heroes. We know Edgar Thomas. He's our hero. But he got for about six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, he was leaning Calvinism. And he's on the radio when Daddy preached on the radio on WGUN there in Atlanta, big gun. And man, he'd preach and he'd get on there and he got to leaning towards that Calvinism, teaching Calvinism, irresistible grace. He was preaching at Harriman. Daddy was in heaven. He's preaching over at Harriman. I can't think of that brother's name, but you know, Plemons. And he called me and he said, he said, brother, he talked like this. He said, Brother Tony, I want to talk to you. He said, I'm fixed to go to the other side. And said, but I want to tell you something before I go. He said, I didn't get to tell Curtis. But he said, Curtis was right. And I got cold chills. I said, Brother Edgar, you don't know me in a pod. You're my hero. He said, no, no, I was wrong. I got in a ditch. He said, I got in a ditch. He said, Curtis was right. Y'all don't want to hear this part. 
You just want to keep silent and say nothing. They, well, you know, you're just jealous. The reason you're calling that out is because you don't have any meat. Let me, can I help you? I'm getting to the age, honestly, where I'd rather be coon hunting. I'm grateful for the privilege to preach. Don't misunderstand me. The Lord hears me and he knows the intents of the heart. But, and, I, and you can't lie to God. But I'm telling y'all, I'm an old man now. I got two grandkids at the house. I got a good walking horse. I got, I got several hounds, tree of coon. It's a job to come out here. This ain't no adventure, praise God. I'm telling you, it, hey, this is full time, friend. It's not jealousy. It's not looking for another meeting. This is, I've, preached, I've preached sermons like I'm preaching right now, and I knew it was going to cost me when I preached it. I used to say all the time, you can't do wrong and get by, and it's true, but I've learned you can't do right and get by. You take the stand where you ought to stand, and every time you do, every single time, there's repercussions. Every single time you do it, there's a reproach. There's a reproach in a company standing where you ought to stand. He's jealous. He's full of pride. Internet. You, you mean you're questioning him? No man's above being questioned. No man's above being questioned. Those fair words and fine speeches has got them through for a long time. I think this is sermon number two. We're in a battle. Some of you are like conscientious observers. <laughs> if you don't love it, leave it. Let this song that I'm singing be a warning. Are y'all listening? When you're running down my doctrine horse, you're walking on the fighting side of me. I've been taught better than this. My daddy died preaching this. He died holding the standard of separatism. When you start compromising on these little bits, sooner or later be the gospel. Sooner or later we'll be, bapti- we'll be receiving people in our church that's been baptized by a church of Christ. I've never asked a convert, oh, are you pleased with your mode of baptism? No, is God pleased with it? If you was baptized by a tongue-talking, fire-breathed apostolic, hey, you're going to get redunked at our church. If you was baptized by a Camelite bunch of Church of Christ, you're going to get it twice, stay man. <laughs> Pedo-baptism, talking about, hey, God, help. there ain't no Bible for that. That's where it all leads to, charismatics, that music that they use. Well, if you don't believe in that music, why are you preaching it to places where they use that music? Amen. And you watch that crowd, the first thing coming is a pink light around the cross at the baptistry. And a little glass pulpit. Somebody say amen. I'd feel like I was naked preaching behind something like that. Somebody say amen. The audacity. Nobody speaks against it. The apathy, nobody. I mean, and here's this Sam's dude who, from over here somewhere who's telling everybody how to go back and take a church from a King James position into a ESV. Look, look up in here. And, and we got people who, from our generation who's taking pictures with them. Rubbing, I don't even take pictures with Hank Jr., buddy, and I'd like one of those. Somebody say Amen. Somebody say amen from the deck over here. If I said Elvis, my wife would say, whoa! You'll, it's on there forever. What you put on that internet don't go off. Amen. Yeah. Lift your voice loud like a trumpet. 
He said, cry aloud is what Isaiah said, 58.1. Cry aloud and spare not. This is where I'm going to preach for the next hour. On that sparing not. We get to picking what we don't want to preach. Spare not was a military term. That meant when you go in, the, the, the general, the colonel would say, now you're going in this village and kill them all. Don't leave anything. Saul had the mistake of sparing. It wrecked him. It wrecked Saul. And when you spare in your preaching, it's going to come back to bite you like a big old tiger will. He spared not and it cost him. He kept back the best. Well, I ain't going to preach that because it may run somebody off. Hey, I've learned this. When people leave our church, God will send three or four to see why they left. You just need to preach on. You just need to go down and spare not. There's not a page of the Bible you ought to be afraid to preach. 2 Corinthians 10 said, For our weapons are, 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 of our warfare are not carnal. We can't whoop people. I mean, I've thought about it. If you hadn't, you ain't ever pastored a Baptist church. Our weapons are, he asked Dr. Malone, said, have you ever thought about divorce? He said, no, but I've thought about murder several times, he said. <laughs> now, it's going in one ear and out the other on a bunch of y'all. But you ain't going to be saved to say I didn't tell you. And when you lose your young people to that crowd, when you lose your family, I was preaching in West Virginia. I ain't finished all this. I was preaching in West Virginia. And I hit along these lines that ought to be hit on all the time. Because all these young people, they ain't heard it. A man came up to me and said, with tears weeping. He said, I used to be a pastor. He said, my wife got to liking these that were borderline. And said, then it got a little bit worse and said, I noticed her wanting to start changing the way she dressed. Oh, that, I know here, I, know, I already know what your, your rebuttal I know what your rebuttal is. Oh, that could happen anyway. That could happen. With, I'm, 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 I'm telling you what did happen. This is not hypothetical. Like all of your arguments. This is a real one. And he said, Brother Tony, weeping. He said, she got with that crowd. And that crowd's that, that crowd. That's that, that's that moderate. That's that used to be us. It's not us anymore. That crowd that we're intolerant, but they can't stand us. They're the only, I got hurt in a Baptist church. <laughs> I was hurt. What, what do you want, a plaque? You want a t-shirt? We got them at our church. It's got my picture on it. It says, and he did it. <laughs> Said she's left me. It all started with that no boundary. There ought to be some lines drawn tonight. There he was, and David's looking at that Bathsheba. And I can hear that contemporary music playing it down, 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 he said, who's that? Nobody's saying nothing. And one fella said, David, you don't, you don't want to do this. And one said, 
this contemporary music's wrong. And one said, these new Bibles, that ain't it. And one said, just rubbing shoulders with somebody that rubs shoulders with anything that goes, that ain't what we are. And one said, this immodesty is not going to get it. Let's stand together, our heads are bowed now. Why not tonight, you be the one. You be the one back in Modesto, California. You be the one in Chico, California. You be the one in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Why don't you be the one in Nashville, Tennessee? Why don't you be the one? They're going to start playing an invitation hymn. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Father, thank you so much for what we've heard all week. And thank you for this tremendous message tonight. And I pray that we might wake up before it's too late. Bless these dear, dear people. Give them safety to their homes over the next few days, their ministries. And God, I pray that they would these pastors and pastors' wives would have people that would stand with them. I pray that you give us courage to do right. I pray that we look at our little children and see what they're going to inherit if we don't see things change quickly. I think of the corruption coming in our churches. It's just overwhelming how, how quickly it's, things are changing. I thank you for the Brother Tony Hudson tonight for what he means to me personally and for the fact that he preaches like a man, preaches like a man of God. Bless his life. I know the devil's going to try to bother him tonight, think that he was too, too strong. But telling the truth is never too strong. 
bless him, we pray. His wife, family, his church, in Jesus' name, amen. With that apology, I stand right with what he just said. Would you be please, please sit down there, if you will? I will not re-preach the message. But I guarantee it, if I went to every pastor that's been preaching here this week, and I'm looking at them, they'd all agree. That's the need of the hour. And I don't like to bring age into it. I'm very careful about it these days. But I'm older than every one of the preachers here this week that's preached. I'm too close to the finish line. And I do not want to leave my people in bondage spiritually. I've worked to make it sure that financially they're okay. But I want this church to be a church that brings in that new wave that's going to destroy their children. I've, I've, I've preached a long time. Uh, I began full time March the 14th, 1971. So how many years? That It's a long time. And, and I've watched everywhere I go, things change. Been traveling this country for so many years, decades. And compromise never saved a nation. And our nation is gone because of what we won't say. I hope you'll pray about it. I hope you'll think about it. And... Uh, I felt like, Brother Hudson, I know the devil's going to work on you. I felt like you were very kind. I, th I, I feel like he tempered himself because I know what he'd like to say. But it's clear enough. And uh, please keep our churches sound so our children will have something. Appreciate you being here so very much this week. I, I got this real sweet note on this question and answer card uh, about someone a few years ago. I said, why don't you go home and train somebody? And this dear pastor's wife knows how to play the piano very well. I hear, I've heard her, been in their church. And uh, so I went home, I took that challenge some years ago and I, I taught a girl how to play, Rachel. And then uh, she the, became the pianist, and she taught her brother how to play. And uh, now they're both pianists. Go home and teach somebody. We gotta get some pianists back in there. We talked about that this week. I hope you will. I, uh, we have a gift tonight for every night, preachers. The, uh, the uh, stainless steel tumbler is from Golden State Baptist College, so go by their booth tonight and you can get this every senior pastor. And then for Brother Reamers, just these in closing, uh, I wanna say, this is the book by Brother Bud Silva, and he and his wife allowed us to print it several years ago. I remember the day, the pictures are here of all the caskets. Uh, his church was running a brand new church. I think it was about 25 people and 10 died on that accident on the way to school, including his wife and two of his three children. The only child that left that was left was Charity, and she's a preacher's wife now. And I thank God for Brother Silva's present wife all these many, many years, decades they've been married. That really gave him approval to print this. You think your life, he had a, about half of his church all killed in one morning in a head-on collision going, and, and Sandy, there you are. We admire you so much. This book has helped so many people. And why my wife and I admire you so much because what you did, not only for charity, but what you did for that man of God. I love Bud Silva. Uh, I wrote his name down the other day I mentioned, I never go to my peers, never went to my peers, but my peers now, Brother Johnson, 
Brother Sylvia, your name's there, are old enough, they're no longer peers. They're proven men of God. And uh, this is such a good book. I hope you'll go out and get it. It's $12 tonight. And uh, here, here's a booklet. It is great. Uh, North Valley Baptist Church reached me. And adults that wrote this in our church, this is just a, there's many adults, but this church has been built off of winning people to Christ. And uh, I hope you'll get that tonight. And that's $12. Then Brother Andy Harrell uh, was with me for 19 years. He's now been the pastor of his home church for the last 17 years. And uh, this book just flies off the, behind every great leader. I, I forgot this story, or I never heard it. He was just here two weeks ago preaching. And he told my staff, I remember years ago when a man in this church called me and said, I want to pick you up today. So he came by, and he said, I, Brother Harold said, where are we going? He goes, I'm going to buy you a brand new infinity. It will not cost you a dime. I just want to buy you a car. And they said, you know, Pastor is driving the security car. He sold his car for this church. In fact, the security car was an old CHP car, and I was driving it one day, and literally while I was driving it, the steering wheel fell off. <laughs> I had to park it right there sideways, and they came and picked it up. He said, first of all, you didn't contact my pastor. And secondly, he needs a car more than me, and I, I, I'm not going to even look with you. He said, I believe in loyalty, and that would have been disloyal. That he, he, he is a great follower and a great leader. That's a good book, and that's $12. The purpose of the church. I hope you'll stop by and get What What is the purpose of the church? And, and um, our, our purpose here is the next generation. That's why I appreciate that message. I, I, we've got, we have to leave something in this next generation. And you cannot leave garbage. Uh, our, our purpose is the bus ministry Amen. and worldwide missions and prayer and giving and preaching and the Sunday school and pra patriotism and soul winning and music and building and uh, male and female and holiness. It's, I think it's a book you'll want to pick up for $14 then th this is the best price you'll get on the hymn books this week if you want them for your church. You know, a book like this, a hardback, is $30, $40 nowadays. And uh, the hardback book, the conference rate is $13.50. And uh, I hope you'll think of that. And you can also get the other one, Songs and Hymns Revival, or Songs and Hymns. This is the one we use from the heart. Well, it's been a wonderful week. And I appreciate God's people so much. Appreciate you preachers and the very fact they stayed all week. Next year is our 40th anniversary and plans are already being made. It's the church's 50th anniversary and we're going to make it special for you if the Lord tarries. And, um, and uh, if it's the rapture of the church before then, I'll leave some messages in here. And Brother Hudson, you can preach them or somebody can preach them. We'll see. How about nine, page 94? Let's sing it while you're seated right there. Page number 94. In the harvest field now ripen, there's a work for us to do. Little as much when God is in it. Sing it together. In the harvest.
five years ago we began to sing this at the last uh, night. God be with you till we meet again. And it's a great old song written by the music director of the old M Moody Bible Institute and an old preacher, Jeremiah Rankin. Sing it together. God be with you. his wings protect and hide you. Daily manna still provides you. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again when life's perils thick confound you. Put his arms unfailing round you. God be with you. I wonder what you're going to face this year. And every one of you God's people and God's men, you're going to face some things. They're going to be hard things. They're difficult things. Endure hardness as a good soldier. Let's not quit on God. Let's not quit. And when God sends your wife as that one man, that one person, that one lady that we heard tonight, listen. When the Spirit of God speaks, let's listen. On that last stanza, sing it together. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you. songbook one last song brother flood has been the director of all this activity this week and i have deacons and, and church members and staff members and many of them are going to put in by the video a couple several hundred people tonight working for hours tonight because we're going to turn all the buildings around for sunday morning and uh, they've got a lot to do and god bless them brother flood i'm so thankful for you and planning and organizing and all that you've done. Give the man a big hand, will you please? Yes. I, I just want to briefly tell you thank you to our delegates and for coming. Uh, a conference like this would not be possible without you all making the financial investment to come and the, all the travel plans. And it really is an honor and it's a privilege to host this conference because and as every preacher has mentioned, and God knows, we need good churches in America right now. And so it is a sincere privilege. And our church members have worked and they've labored and they prayed for this conference and financially invested as well for you all, that you all would go back and do something in your home church and continue faithfully serving. And it's just such a privilege and honor. We're looking forward to already in the very last page of your booklet, and the very last announcement I'll make, 
is next year's conference date. So write them down on your calendar. We're we'll looking forward to next year. Thank you, Brother Clyde. And to my dear people, and many I know are not in here tonight, but thank you so much. Uh, from, I see the chef back there, the meal on Sunday, and all the labor, the contractors. Uh, you're incredible people. I love the people of North Valley so very much. I wonder if we could sing All Hail the Power. Let's stand together, page 44. Last time to sing, so let's give it everything we have. Sing it on the first stanza. song books back please right where they belong for the flood can you get the preachers over there if you will we'll get you over to the other place and um what are we eating tonight is it American. does that mean chick-fil-a oh boy i'm hungry for that tonight all the expense of you people gasoline vehicles airline tickets hotels You've been, spent a lot of money this week, and we are so thankful. You've helped our people. And you know, something like this gives me great hope. Yes, we're losing it. We are losing it big time. But I don't feel like we're losing it after being around you this week. He's still on the throne. And I'd like to sing some more. I love you dearly. God bless you. You're dismissed.